So, here we are, chat. Final thoughts on Final Fantasy Adventure. If I had to give a quick summary of it, I think it is a game that is very interesting to speedrun because of the number of glitches in the game. Um, from a standpoint of a casual playthrough, I think it's okay. I think in terms of combat, I think the combat is actually fine. I think the combat, for the most part, has aged pretty well. I like being able to walk around with a potentially variety of weapons. Uh, that both have different ranges and different specials. If you wait enough time, that has, there's like basically a stamina meter at the bottom. If you let it full charge, you get a super attack. Otherwise, you get uh, varying uh, damage multipliers on your swing. And I kind of like that mechanic. So it's just not all button mashing. You have to kind of think uh, what you want in any given scenario. There's some light elemental damage weapons. There's like crushing damage versus like piercing damage equivalencies. They don't have like names in the game per se, but there's clearly weapons that some enemies are weak to and others are not. Um, the level ups themselves, I'm torn on whether or not I like them. I like the concept of you picking stats to focus on. So there's four major stats of the game. You have power, which raises damage. You have stamina, which raises defense as well as health if you gather enough points. You have willpower, which determines how quickly that stamina gauge refills for your super attacks, which also influences spell damage, which is the final point of willpower, where you can slowly increase your MP and other associated things with uh, spells. However, in our playthrough, we literally did not bother with spells. I will say, though, the biggest detriments to the game themselves are probably the dungeons. And that's where it makes it a little harder to just straight up recommend. So, like, the non-spoiler version is... You are required to use consumables to clear the dungeons. It is not optional, it is 100% mandatory. So you need to buy keys at shops. You get something called a mattock pretty early on in the game, which will be used to destroy boulders. And honestly, until you really get a weapon that replaces the at least the mattox, most of your inventory just ends up being cluttered with this junk. And while the inventory size is not bad, it would have been so much better if you had a separate collection of Maddox and things like keys. If they had if they had stuck a little more closely to like Zelda, where that could have been like your bomb counter and your key counter. Like if those had been separated, then I don't think there would have been that many issues with the game. But the fact that live like, I don't know, like a 20 or so inventory slot, I'd really count. Not not a big amount of room. But if like 10 of those are items that are literally Maddox and keys, and they don't stack to a high amount. So if you get a key that has four uses and a key that has three uses, you can't combine them into seven. And you can't combine like a one and a one to make a two. They're, they're just forever separated. So there's a little bit of an annoyance with some of the inventory management of the game, which is a shame because I think there are some very interesting consumable items that don't really show up later in the series. And uh, things like refilling your willpower instantly for super attacks or potentially boosting your strength sadly end up kind of being pushed to the side just due to the fact that this inventory issue is a big problem throughout the game. Um... I don't feel like the game is like overly hard, so for people who are just looking for a very simple, more action-oriented version rather than exploration necessarily of something similar to Zelda, the kind of top-down view as you play is pretty close. And I do like finding like the hidden passageways. It has the co the classic, you hit them, it ha makes a different sound, and you can determine where to bomb kinds of things. Um, there's You could do things like whip across gaps in order to go past poles. The game wants you to freeze enemies, which sounds cool in concept, but it ends up being very annoying towards the end of the game to weigh down switches. I do like that there's like little mini puzzles throughout. It does make the dungeons feel a bit more fresh than something like Zelda, honestly. Uh, most, of the, most of the other kinds of games in a similar genre just have what would be like push puzzles, but this one has like hit switches in different orders or like time your attacks to flip like what path you're going on. So I think it actually has a decent variety throughout to keep the dungeon somewhat interesting. It's just unfortunately weighed down with the inventory management system, which is a bit of a shame. Um, in, in terms of plot and characters, you know, it, it's a basic Game Boy game. Don't expect, like, a, a written novel of an RPG. It's very simple in concept. I think it does what it needs to do with the dialogue, but it's not anything to really write home about either. Uh, I do like that it introduces the partner system, which does, I think, help it stand out a little more from being, like, another kind of Legend of Zelda-style game where essentially you'll have a partner you can ask to help you to do something. So some of them are pretty useless. They just give you very basic tips. And unless you are literally brand new to the game, you will not find them useful. 
or they will do very useful things like constantly restoring your HP, your MP, potentially acting as a shopkeeper. And those kinds of things are very good. And it's kind of nice when you have those partners. There are a couple times where partners do end up trolling you, which can lead to some frustrating moments, like needing to push enemies onto switches, for example, and then your partner like laser blasts them from existence. That happened a few times in our playthrough. Uh, I think it was throwing knives in one scenario specifically, but it can happen with a couple different attacks, unfortunately. Um, the boss patterns are fairly simple, so it's like it's definitely meant for like a younger audience as opposed to being like bullet hell or like super difficult to figure out. Um, and because we ended up going pure power, the boss battles didn't take too long. I do like that it rewards you for positioning, so not only just from the standpoint of dodging, but if you position well, you could potentially double hit bosses or even triple hit, depending on what their movement is. So I do feel like from a replayability standpoint, there is a lot to kind of showcase or flex on when you play the game. And the gameplay as I said before, pretty solid. There's only a couple problem areas, and most of them just have to do with the inventory management itself. So if you're even somewhat interested in kind of like a simpler action adventure kind of game, uh, I would recommend it from that standpoint. Do be aware though that even though it offers things like a map, the maps are mostly useless unless you're in a dungeon. For whatever reason, there is a world map that, while yes, it technically maps the world, it doesn't show you what the icons on the spaces do. So in like this massive world map, you don't know if a tile is a river, a dock, a mountain, a cave, a dungeon, a town. They're just all the same color. Actually, with the exception of town, they mark where the towns are, but the way you kind of get to the towns is not as straightforward as you think it would be, especially as you get later in the game and you unlock other means of transportation, where not knowing where rivers are is kind of annoying because that ends up being one of your modes of uh, transportation. And it's very easy to not get to where you need to go because your destination is not straightforward. Like, for example, we had a couple of uh, scenarios where our goal was the upper left of the map, but to get there, we had to be on the far right of the map. Like, it's stuff that... If you were playing any other game of the genre, you would not... It, it's kind of hard to positionally think where everything is. It's not one of those world maps where it cuts off and you can't go further left, up, down, or right. It'll wrap around. And because the map is somewhat big and you need to go very specific spots, uh, it is fairly easy to get lost on a couple of points of the game, unfortunately. It does very well up until you get the alternate paths. Like, it's somewhat linear. There's sometimes alternate paths you could take for shops. Um, don't expect, like, a completely open world, because this is more story-based, I would say, than pure exploration. So if people are looking for, like, a very open world game, I feel like this will probably not be up your alley. Like, it's not like a Legend of Zelda where you could pick what dungeon you go to. It's like there's a very clear progression. You have to do certain things to progress the plot. There are not a lot of alternates to do. So while we did things very slightly out of order in the plot, um, it's not quite as crazy as, or freeform as something like a Zelda. But yeah, I would say if you're even somewhat interested in it, uh, we got it as part of the Mana Collection, but you can find other means to play the game as a standalone. Uh, I will state that there is a remake of the game that gets rid of some of these issues, but I, I don't feel like from a story standpoint or some of the combat, it quite feels as fun as Adventure, sadly. So a lot of people will end up not picking Sword of Mana, which is another version of this game up. Uh, we did not play the remake, the 3D remake of Adventures of Mana. I might try that again in the future. I don't know if I'd recommend that or not over this one, sadly, given that I haven't played it before. But I will state from a non-spoiler standpoint, I think that's all I have to really say. I do like the soundtrack, even though it is very short. And I think for the most part, I really enjoy, like, of its about seven-ish hour playthrough with some prior experience. Maybe with no experience in guide, it might take you closer to nine. Um, and definitely for speedrunning, it could take you three. But <laughs> from that standpoint, um, I think it's, it's not bad. I, I would say, like, on the collection itself, I got a decent amount of entertainment from it. I would say three quarters of the time I had fun. There's only like really two dungeons where I just dreaded going into them. And that's mostly again due to issues with the puzzles where it's just very easy to know what it wants you to do, but to not be able to do anything about it due to enemy movement. 
In particular, snowmen getting stuck in walls, snowmen being too close to a wall to begin with, and then like really annoying hazards in like the push puzzles. I don't know why they did that, to be honest. And as I said before, if you don't go in with the early warning that you need these consumables, it is entirely possible to get stuck and have to backtrack all the way out of the dungeon. So I had that fear drilled into me. I brought a million keys. I brought a million Maddox and that ended up not being an issue in a playthrough. But for a brand new player, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I definitely when I first played the game blind, I assumed you would always get keys or Maddox eventually in a dungeon, and if you wanted more for side rooms, they were there. And then after I played a few dungeons, I went, oh no, I have to buy these every time. Oh no. <laughs> like, like, it's just like, uh-oh, <laughs> that, that's not good. So just be warned about it. That is definitely the two of the biggest issues, inventory management and also making sure you have enough of the keys. I would say, generally speaking, as long as you have at least three Maddox, I would say four and three keys, I think you're generally fine and you won't get stuck anywhere. But towards the end of the game, get at least four sets of keys. Because you won't need Maddox once you get, uh, I think it's called the Morning Star, or just Star in the game itself. And the rest can be used for your healing or backup things or whatever you want. So anyway, chat, I guess we'll go into the spoilers briefly. I don't have too much to say from the spoiler side. Honestly, I mean, the ending is kind of whatever. The ending is kind of whatever. Um, I thought it was interesting with some of the villains throughout. I liked... I like that we did see, like, Dark Lord and Julius throughout most of the game. I will give it credit because there are a lot of games where the villain is just, like, some guy you've never heard of essentially the whole game maybe somebody will just name him once before you see him and that's about the extent of their involvement in the plot but it does feel like the game at least tries to you know circle who the villains are throughout and kind of go through i did like that little reveal of the uh, mysterious man in the cave being the villain i thought that was a nice i thought that was a nice moment in the game where it was kind of interesting to see the villain help us there um, some of the some of the villains are kind of one shot and forgettable. Like the mansion guy, Darius or whatever, is pretty forgettable. Um, unfortunately, they do reuse a lot of the boss sprites. I mean, the double dragon at the or the fact that it was triple dragon at the end. I'm like, come on. I'm like, enough dragons. Stop it. <laughs> we're we're sprite reusing literally on the final dungeon. <laughs> like, stop that. Uh, our our character definitely suffered a case of the big dumb. Man, if you if you look at our story start to finish. We failed at, like, every task we were given. It was fantastic. I think the only thing we succeeded at was getting Excalibur. I'm <laughs> gonna be honest with you. Everything else we bombed on. Saving the girl, ain't. Stopping the villain from getting the pendant, ain't. <laughs> Helping the Genma Knight out, ain't. Left him on the airship. <laughs> so we, we failed pretty bad as a hero. I'm not gonna lie throughout, which is very unintentionally hilarious. I do like that we could bully the townspeople. I didn't feel like killing them on screen. They are very tanky, as I said before. You could, I think you can also cause them to clip from existence. It's very easy with the Morning Star and the Starting Village, for example. But I just didn't feel like doing that in our playthrough. But you could wedge them in a place they can't go and they get deleted. Um... I mean, there were, like, a couple of buggy things, but I don't think they, like, really harmed the game in any way. I would say probably the Moogle item being useless was probably the only detrimental bug. Like, that item legitimately has no purpose. And by the time you get Unicorn, honestly, I don't think any of the status ailments matter. The worst status ailment by far was Poison. The fact that that stupid white mouse, like, was one of the biggest threats in the entire dungeon is, like, insane to me. Like, if we didn't have heal, he'd be doing, like, 90 to 100 damage for, like, 250 health. <laughs> like, that enemy was so unfair, with especially since it could kind of clip through things, which is unfortunate. I guess we did have some weird spawns of enemies. Um, but fortunately, we were able to kind of manipulate it, knowing that if we don't kill everything in a room and we exit and re-enter, the room will repopulate. Or we could save and load in the game again, just to force the enemies to respawn. So I think from that standpoint, you know, it was fun. We also showcased, uh, clipping to the end of the game. 
<laughs> essentially. Chat saw me go to the snow area. Right, chat? Remember that? I got the scythe, which was cutting down plants, and then oops, snow area. <laughs> so I skipped, I skipped like five hours of gameplay, I think. <laughs> right, chat? I'm pretty sure. I skipped an entire session's worth. It's kind of insane, actually, when you think about it, how much of the game you can skip. And we didn't even do all the skips. I just decided to do that on a whim, and it worked. It worked within, like, five tries. It really was not that hard. And that's without knowing how it works. If I knew how it would work, then I'm sure it would have been, like, first or second try easy. But just watching somebody do it and going, yeah, I could probably do that <laughs> was good enough for it. So I'm, I'm happy I got to showcase that in our playthrough. But otherwise, Chad, I don't really have anything else to say. I, this is, like... This will be more of a nostalgic pick for me, but I, you know, it, it was fine. I'm not going to call it Game of the Year or anything. I think it did what it needed to do. And I think for the most part, I think almost everything has aged well other than the dialogue and the inventory management. But it, but to be fair, even then it sucked. Dialogue was like, hmm, if you're expecting more modern RPGs, you could be disappointed. But anyway, Chan, I think that's all I have to say. If there's anything you want to say about the game, now's your time. But I think this will be one of our shorter final thoughts. This is not a very long game. Fine sums it up perfectly. Exactly. This is kind of something if you just want to try it. Go ahead. I'm not going to push it or anything. It's nice that it's part of the Mana Collection, though, I will say. That definitely helps with if you just want a group of games that are related. All at once, which is kind of convenient. And uh, yeah, I think we'll continue to see more of those in our future. But for now, chat, that's for no a topic for another time. So let's go ahead and say goodbye to YouTube one last time. So if you did watch to this point in the video of the VOD, I'd like to say thank you for watching our final thoughts, and hope to see you again in Secret of Mana.